Good morning, professor and classmate. My name is Vương Thị Uyên. Now a master student in plant immunology lab that is belong to Professor Kim Sang Hui. Today, I would like to introduce some typical experiments in my lab. Let's go to the first part: introduction. As we know, during the living time, plant is affected by several different stresses, such as abiotic stress caused when abiotic factor like temperature, water, salt are over the normal range of the plant. They can suppress the plant growth. On the other hand, biotic stress also interfere to the plant growth by some living organism like bacteria, fungi, virus, insect. They cause the disease to the plant and we call they are pathogen. To survive, plant need to recruit the sophisticated mechanism to combat to the pathogen and its name is plant immune system. Let's make an overview about human and plant immune systems. Our body has both innate immune system and adaptive immune system to suppress the pathogen. In the case of plant, I would like to show an example that Arabidopsis plant is infected by DC3000, one kind of common disease bacteria strain. The zoom in picture show that DC3000 are spreading down in this leaf tissue, indicated by the green color. Actually, unlike like human, plant has only innate immune system, so how can they solve this problem and it is enough to limit the pathogen infection? And the answer is yes, by co-evolutionary progress between pathogen and plant, the people summarized the model of plant innate immunity by a zigzag model showing in here. Firstly, pathogen has some common structure like flagellin in bacteria, chitin in fungi, or etc. They are denoted by PAMs, pathogen associated molecular pattern. When pathogen inject into the plant tissue, PAMs can be recognized by transmembrane receptor PRR. After recognizing, PRR sends the signal into the cell to activate the host protein to produce some compounds like RS, salicylic acid, or other antimicrobial compounds. These compounds will be secreted out the apoplast to suppress the pathogen trigger the first layer immunity, PTI, pattern trigger immunity. We can see the chick model below. In the presence of pumps, the level of defense is increased over the threshold for effective defense. Over this level, plants start a defense response. However, pathogens always want to overcome the PTI. They develop a new strategy by secreting some protein effector that can interfere to the host protein and suppress the PTI, induce disease susceptibility. This event is called ETS, effector trigger susceptibility. Now, in Chichak model, the presence of effector can reduce the defense level of plant until lower than threshold of effective defense. Plant now is completely dizzy. To survive, plant has to recruit a new strategy to suppress ETS by an evolutionary progress. Now, plant has NLR resistant protein that can recognize effectors specifically by directing or indirecting pathways. After recognizing, our protein can associate with some other protein in the downstream to express the immune gene and trigger the defense response. This event is called ETI, effector trigger immunity, lead to hypersensitive response that related to cell death symptom. Cell death is to limit the pathogen spreading down to another healthy tissue. In the model, the presence of resistant protein can boost the defense level over the threshold for hypersensitive response. That is the highest level of plant immune system, and the plant becomes the winner. There are a lot of effectors from different pathogens in the nature, and my project now is focusing on a type 3 effector, AVRPPHB. The mechanism how the plant can recognize and resist to this effector is well known now. 
AVRPPHB is a cysteine protease. It is secreted by Percival Russell G. It can cleave a decoy protein PBS1, and the cleavage product of PBS1 can interact with and activate RPS5 resistant protein to trigger the ETI. Interestingly, in 2016, the people published a science paper to prove that they could modify the specific cleavage site of AVRPPHB in PBS1 by other effector specific cleavage site to expand the recognition specificity of RPS5. We can see in the model here, originally, RPS5 can recognize only AVRPPHB. However, after modifying, RPS5 can recognize successfully three more avirulent factors, AVRPT2, TEVNA protease, TUMVNA protease. This discovery can be applied into the crop plants to contribute in crop disease problems. To develop this potential, now my project is to apply this engineering decoy model into tomato to suppress some disease caused by virus, TEV and PVY that are the common pathogens reduce a lot of tomato productivity in the world. For constructing, my main strategy is to make the tomato PBS1 modification to check whether after modifying they can induce resistant protein activation or not. In the PBS1, I would like to swap a VIPPHB cutting site to a PVY protease cutting site, TEV protease cutting site, or insert 5 alanine to make SL PBS1 variant construct. There are several experiment methods are used to prove our hypothesis. However, today I will introduce three different methods. First one, site-directed mutagenesis. Second, selective assay. And the last one, disease assay. Move to the first one, site-directed mutagenesis, to make SLPBS1 modification. Now, I have the original sequence of PBS1 with AVRPPHB cutting site. I'm going to make the PBS1 with TEV protease cutting site. How can I do it? In this method, you need to clone your gene into a plasmid. Later, let's decide two primers at target position. The forward and reverse primers should contain the gene-specific sequence long enough to bind into the template, and the modification sequence should be in frame with your gene. After receiving the primers, you can easily create the expected sequence by PCR reaction. Your primers will work in a circle and finally change from original sequence to the new one. After reaction, your PCR product contains both template plasmid and modified one. To select only the new plasmid, you should do one more step to digest your template by DPNI enzyme. Consequently, you can get the expected clone now. For more detail, based on my experience, I would like to give you some explanation about this method. Firstly, about designing the primers. The mutating part should follow the complementary principle in two primers. Also, you should carefully check the reading frame between the gene-specific part and modifying one. Last one, allowing temperature should have the same level between two primers. The next part is digesting the original plasmid by DPNI enzyme. The mechanism of this reaction is based on the DNA methylation in any living organism. The template is normally amplified from E. coli are methylated, while PCR products are not. DPNI is a digestion enzyme that can digest the methylation position in DNA. That's why the scientists use DPNI as the selector in this method. The PCR product will not be broken and remain after treating enzyme. The main note of this method is try to reduce as much as possible non-expected mutation. You can follow this thing. Firstly, using small plasmid to clone your gene as a template. Second, you should use a high fidelity tech polymerase, such as fusion tech. Also, you need to confirm your clone candidate by sequencing. The second experiment that I would like to introduce today is Sadat assay. 
Sedet assay is a typical experiment used in plant immunology lab to qualitatively determine the defense response in plant. As I explained before, if resistant protein can be activated, it can induce some downstream event to trigger hypersensitive response that related to Sedet symptom. As you can see in my picture, the infected region in this leaf is dyed. That is a signal of ETI event to suppress pathogens spread down to other healthy tissue. Based on this pattern, the people use their dead assay to determine ETI response in plant. In this method, you can express the protein in plant system. Firstly, you should create your binary vector that can help your gene express. Later, your construct should be transformed into agrobacteria as the host delivery. The last step is setting your experiment with a suitable concentration of bacteria and infiltrate into the plant. The result can be checked continuously depending on your protein. If that happened, it means ETI happened. I would like to show you some examples about that symptom in Arabidopsis and tomato leaves that I performed in my lab. Here are some problems that I summarized. Firstly, Sometimes the responses are not strong enough to see the sadness symptom, so we need to use the staining method to confirm. Also, some plant cultivar are really sensitive to bacteria infiltration, then they can cause the fake sadness result even on negative control. Also, maybe you guys will wonder that normally if the plant has the cell death problem, they can be died. But the answer is no. Actually, for experiment, we infiltrated the high concentration of bacteria to improve the immune response. That's why we have another experiment to naturally check the immune response in the plant. Let's move to the next part, DCRC. In the DCSA, we used a low concentration of pathogen solution to expose the plant with bacteria naturally. After dipping, the plants are observed several days later to check the symptom. If the plants are healthy, it means they can resist to that pathogen. In contrasting, if the plant becomes dizzy, it means they are susceptible to that pathogen. However, to quantitatively confirm the result, we should do more growth curve assay. By taking the certain square unit from leaf tissue, we can count the number of bacteria per square unit, such as centimeter. I'm showing an example about the bacteria number from healthy tissue and dizzy leaves. You can see the significant difference between them. By using computer, we can make a chart like this from this data. I concluded that M82 tomato plant plant is resistant to DC3000 contained AVRPPHB because it can suppress the bacteria growth. I'm gonna bring to you guys a table to compare between Sedet assay and DZ assay. Firstly, these methods are both used to check the ETI response in plant. However, they have some different points like that. In the case of Sedet assay, after ETI happened, hypersensitive response happened and induced the cell death. On the other hand, in the case of DZRC, because we deliver the pathogen to the plant slowly and naturally, so that's why after ETI happen, the plant can recognize the presence of pathogen and produce some immune gene expression or antimicrobial compound strong enough to combat to the pathogen. That's why the plant can be healthy and successfully suppress the pathogen growth. Technically, sedate assay introduced pathogen into plant artificially artificially by infiltration bacteria into apoplast, unlike DZRC do it naturally. Also, Sedet assay used a high concentration of bacteria at a certain position, unlike DZRC is for whole plant with low bacteria solution. That's why Sedet assay saw the result within a short time, but DZRC requires several days. And the last difference of this method is, in the case of sedate assay, resistance should show a sedate symptom, but DZRSA should show a healthy status if it can suppress the pathogen. 
And that is everything in my presentation. Here is Plant Immunology Lab, where can I study and improve myself a lot. Finally, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to your question and recommendation. Thank you so much.